It so happens that I'm recording this online lesson on St George's Day. That's right, the 23rd of April. As the patron saint day for England, this is a special day for the English. So we're going to start by considering who the English are. I'm going to show you a source in a moment that was written about the English by someone from France who visited here. Your questions will be how recently you think this might have been written, so give a year or decade. And does this appear to be a fair description of the English? Explain with an example. Let's have a look at the description. The English men and women like to have short hair and do not like beards. They like to drink beer a lot and they love to fight, even with each other. Often they will drink until they were sick. Hmm, what do we think about that as a description of the English? Take a moment to decide on a year or decade and then decide whether that's a fair description. Pause the video now. Well, when I've asked classes in the past when they think this was written, many of them think this is a contemporary source or written within the last 10 years or so. A few think it might have been written by, back in the 1960s. Some, who are given it even more thought, might have thought that this was written about the English during the First World War when British soldiers were stationed in France. Well, all of those are wrong. It was written around the year 1000 AD. Of course, I've updated the language and translated it into English, but I've not changed any of the meanings. So is this a fair description of the English? Well, some of the less desirable character traits that are sometimes attributed to the English are within here. Their love of beer, for example. It is the national drink and it was much safer to drink a thousand years ago than, uh, than the water was. Um, do they like to fight? Well, maybe there are some scenes that we don't like uh, seeing on the news, um, but perhaps that's a little bit unfair. And the short hair stuff? Well, fashions change all the time, don't they? But it's interesting to see this view of the English from so long ago, because this is going to introduce our first part of this new GCSE course. Who ruled Anglo-Saxon England? The aims of this online lesson are to acquire some new vocabulary, to compare the role of different groups within, Ang within Anglo-Saxon England, and to evaluate the effectiveness of Anglo-Saxon government. So without further ado, we'll have a look at some in introductory materials. Here's a few details about the Anglo-Saxons and Normans GCSE course. This part of the study looks at the Anglo-Saxon and Norman Kingdom of England between about the year 1060 and 1087, and then of course moving into the Norman era. That includes how Anglo-Saxon England was run, why there was a crisis over who should be the next king in 1066, who invaded in England in 1066 and why, I'll give you a clue, it wasn't just the one invasion, the Battle of Hastings, which is arguably the most famous event in all of English history, and how William the... Ah, yeah... Technically, before he became King of England, Duke William of Normandy was William the Bastard. Yes, I am swearing in a lesson, but I can't help the man's name. Um, it's all related to his family background, as we'll see. But how William the Bastard became William the Conqueror of England and how he controlled England. Also, uprisings against the Normans and much more besides. So plenty to get us our teeth into. We're going to be starting, though, by looking at how Anglo-Saxon England was run. Firstly then, we need to get some key terms. In Cloak's compendium of annoying old-fashioned words that you need to know today are Anglo-Saxons. This is the name given to the English people until the Norman invasion of 1066. They're named after some of the invading tribes who arrived in about the 5th century after the Romans departed Britain. These were the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes and various others. But the Anglo-Saxons are the group that we're going to be looking at today. Indeed, England comes from Angle the people who came here, the land of the Anglos. Aristocracy. This is the name given to the upper class people in the country, for example, the lords and barons. A hide is a measurement of land. One hide is about 120 acres of land. Government. This is the organisation which helps to rule a country. Finally then, note down these key terms and their meanings. Then as a challenge, give your own definition. For example, give an example of each term. Parliament, for example, in this country, is a form of government. Pause the, the video now while you complete these tasks. Okay, so hopefully we've been able to give an example of government. There are different types of government. For example, there is communism. Uh, communist um, uh, uh, places like China, they use a different system of government to the one that we have here. Uh, there are dictatorships. We've looked at these historically. Think about Hitler's Germany. That was a form of government, even though it wasn't democratic. So there's more, more than one example to, to consider. 
We're now going to have a look at some details of uh, different groups within Anglo-Saxon England who helped to run it. What you're going to do is you're going to summarise the detail on each card, which will appear on the screen, and then explain which groups were most important in A, helping the king, B, protecting the country, and C, feeding the country. That will leave one group left over who we won't have categorised under any of those terms. All right then, we're going to have a look at card number one now. Here it is. So you can complete those tasks and if you want to crack straight on with it, you can pause the video here. If not, I'm going to read it through to you and see if there's any extra explanation and help I can give. So the first group were the Thanes. Yes, that's the right way of saying it. Um, it's got a G in it, but it's silent. Thanes were local lords. There were between 4,000 and 5,000 Thanes in England by 1060. A thane was an important man in the community, holding more land than the peasants and living in a manor house with a tower and a separate church. Thanes were an important part of the aristocracy, its warrior class. So the thanes were expected to keep themselves armed and to have a horse and armour, um, sword, chainmail um, armour and so forth. Uh, so they would have basically been as near to professional soldiers as we kind of get. So once you've got that information, Pause the video and then when you're ready to continue, you can press play and we'll continue. All right, let's have a look at the next group. 10% of the Anglo-Saxon population were slaves. Slaves could be bought and sold. If they committed crimes, they were not often punished as harshly as other people because it might uh, damage their ability to work. That's a bit of a surprising point, isn't it? But then if you think about it, you wouldn't want to damage your property and a slave was effectively property. They were seen more like property than people. The Normans thought that owning slaves was barbaric, but it was a normal part of Anglo-Saxon society. Not only that, but people could choose to become slaves. If their family were in a desperate situation and they needed money, somebody in the family could sell themselves deliberately into slavery and therefore raise that money. Many other slaves were people who were captured in raids and in warfare. Pause the video now while you complete the tasks. Okay, let's move on to the next. Earls. Now, these guys are very important. Earls were the most important aristocrats, the most important men after the king. The relationship between the king and the earls was based on loyalty. The earls competed against one another to be the king's favourite, and the one that the king relied on the most so that the king would give him the most rewards and honour. Sometimes the earls challenged the king to increase their own power. Indeed, it wasn't particularly unusual for an earl to become the next king rather than a family member of the, the king that uh, had just died. So pause the video while you make your appropriate notes on the earls. And lastly, the majority of Anglo-Saxons were peasant farmers who rented small farms that they worked on with their families. Peasants did a set amount of work for the local lord as well as working the land to support themselves and their families. If they did not carry out the work for their lord, they could lose their right to work on their land and live there. So they had to behave. Pause the video and complete the tasks. Alright then, so let's consider it. It's worth bearing in mind that this was a patriarchal society and therefore women had very little power. That said, they actually did have more power and more likelihood of owning their own property in their own right than later uh, became the case with the, um, the Norman uh, society. But the Thanes were all men, the Earls were all men, some slaves would have been women but reasonably few, and of course about half of the peasants were women, women. but even in those relationships the men usually had higher status. So the group that's most in charge of helping the king would be the Earls. They provide advice and they enforce the law on behalf of the king. The group that protects the country really is the Thanes who would serve in the, the army. They're not true professionals as we'd understand today, but they were at least trained. You might also have identified the Earls as being really important in protecting the country as they could raise armies. Lastly, in terms of feeding the country, we've got the slaves, but more to the point, the peasants. Remember, this is a time before supermarkets. Most people had to grow their own food and whatever they didn't eat for themselves, they could sell at market. And that was very much the role of the peasants. The vast, vast, vast majority of people in Anglo-Saxon England lived in small, dispersed villages in the countryside. Towns and cities were few and far between. Indeed, the only thing that we would recognise today as a decent sized town would be things like the Burrs, which were defended settlements we'll look at, and things like um, London, which was really the only city in England at this time. 
We're going to do a quick memory test now to see if you can remember the, the facts that we've just recorded. Without using your notes, and I'm going to give you one minute for the first task, note down the job of a thane. That's 30 seconds gone. Another 30 to go. Ten seconds left. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, just 35 seconds for the next one. Describe how peasants lived. Go. Fifteen seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, quickest one of all. You've got ten seconds to describe the life of a slave. Go. And that's time up. Okay, hopefully you've managed to get the main details down there. You probably felt that you were given quite a long time for the Thane one, so make sure that you've done it in enough detail. Lastly then, you're going to have five seconds to do this last one. What, who was second in command to the king? Go. And your answer should have been earls. All right, let's move on. We're going to have a look at some more information now and make some notes. This time though, we're going to structure our notes. Read the information and create a table with the headings well governed and weakly governed. Underneath these headings, you'll be able to add detailed bullet points about each part of gov English government at this time. Then, at the end of it, complete the extension. Was the government of England more good than weak at this time? Explain your answer. So let's have a look at the first piece of information. You might want to change your video to high definition if you haven't done so already to make the text more clear. You can pause this at any time. The country was ruled by a king, and the king was dependent on help from the lords and from the earls to help him rule effectively. Taxes were paid to the crown, and the people were expected to be loyal to their monarch and fight for him if he needed them. So that's our first section of information. What would we put down under well-governed, and what would we put down under weakly governed? Pause the video while you complete this first task. Okay, hopefully we've identified that there are some good features of well-governed um, uh, a well-governed kingdom here for example the king is not trying to do everything on his own he's got the advice and help of lords and earls to help him rule effectively especially in local areas also there's an organized system of taxation which was necessary to keep the country running and to keep it protected i wouldn't uh, call as well by the standards of the time uh, people being prepared to fight for their king weak government government it actually shows that if people were prepared to fight for their king then they respected his position and that's good evidence of a well-governed country okay the next ones you're going to be able to, to do a bit more independently so i'll read them out and then you can pause them at any time to complete your notes about <clears throat> excuse me about 1.5 million people lived in england in 1066 People lived in small villages. There were only about 15 towns. London and Winchester were the cities, just the two of them. It's worth bearing in mind, actually, that Winchester was typically the, uh, the main capital of the country at this time. Earl Harold Godwinson controlled the richest part of England, which was in the south. He was the Earl of Wessex, but he also was the Earl in Sussex and Kent, too. OK, pause the video now and complete your next section of notes. OK, on to the next section. England was a very rich country because of the good agricultural and pastoral farming land. 
The rich earls built elaborate churches and have luxurious homes. Although there were a lot of poor people, they still had a good life from farming and other trades. Okay, pause the video now. And on to the last section. If you were a peasant who earned five hides of land that he paid tax on, he could become a thane. Merchants who owned ships could also become thanes. Slaves could be set free by their masters, and free peasants could sell themselves into slavery to feed their families. Thanes could become earls, and earls could become kings. Okay, pause the video and complete your last set of notes. Now, I wonder if any of you were trying to find any examples of weak government and were struggling to do so. Well, some of these might be quite tricky. One of the things that suggests weak government is that the king was dependent on the lords and earls, and although that is helpful in some respects, it could undermine the strength of the king's command. Not only that, that the social uh, mobility of many people in Anglo-Saxon society, although a good thing for many, in many ways for them, could actually lead to weak government because it wasn't be, uh, uh, particularly clear who was going to become the next king and who might uh, rise to become a lord. Now, in modern times, that, of course, is a wonderful thing if there's social mobility, but at these times it was tricky because of otherwise rigid social structures. The point is, though, you've probably got a lot more examples under well-governed than weakly governed, and this is a really crucial point. England was, by European standards at the time, a very well-governed kingdom. And this is precisely what made it a tempting target for raids by the Vikings and, of course, later, invasion by the Normans. They would have been invading a country that was already effectively governed with a great taxation system. So, hopefully you've been able to explain the extension as well. We'll move on. We're now going to consider law and order in Anglo-Saxon society. I've included a link to a relevant documentary that was made by Tony Robinson some years ago about law and order in Anglo-Saxon society. You don't have to watch the whole thing, but I've included some date stamps or some time stamps rather that you can use to guide your viewing. I would recommend watching this first before making your notes on the following. So let's imagine the situation. Somebody has just nicked your hard baked loaf of bread and you're not too happy about it. Well, although there was no police force and it was difficult sometimes to get justice in Anglo-Saxon England, there were some established ways of doing this. So let's consider them. Like I say, I urge you to make some detailed notes on this once you've watched the video and once you've considered this information. The first is the Shire Reeve. The Shire Reeve usually dispensed everyday law and order, but there were some specific examples of distinctive social um, Saxon justice. So Shire Reeve, Sheriff, you can see the connection. Firstly, we have the blood feuds. This is where the family of a murdered person were legally allowed to murder a member of the perpetrator's family in return. And then that family could also then get their own revenge by murdering a person in the other family and so on. So if you imagine a situation where two families fell out, there would be a constant cycle of murders between them until basically they decided to give it in. Now, blood feuds could last for generations, but actually they're more of a deterrent, so it's not quite an, as mad an idea as, as it sounds. Because you'd be so scared of entering into a blood feud that might kill other members of your family, you'd be less likely to murder someone yourself. Then we've got the idea of were guild. If you consider a werewolf is a man who turns into a wolf, were guild is man gold. Not a man who turns into some gold, but it's the gold that you pay for killing a man or another person. So wer means man in, in Anglo-Saxon. An early system of compensation. A murderer could escape execution by paying a fine. The amount depended on the importance of the victim. So you'd have to pay an awful lot of gold if you murdered an archbishop, but not very much at all if you murdered a peasant. Although in those circumstances, it would be still more than most people could afford. Then we have trial by ordeal. It's pretty yucky, this. Um, but the idea is that if you cannot prove your innocence, but equally no one can prove your guilt, God should decide whether you're guilty or not. So the accused person would undergo a painful ordeal, typically burning or scalding. They would either have to hold on to a red hot iron and walk seven paces. So just imagine how long that would take you. Or perhaps they would have to plunge their hand into a boiling cauldron of water, retrieve a stone and imagine the scalding on the skin. Once they had done that, their wounds would be bandaged and then a little while later they'd undo the bandages and see how it was healing. So if it was healing nicely, then God was helping you out and you were innocent. If it was all infected and pus filled, then I'm afraid God thought you were guilty and therefore you were then given the full punishment. 
So the speed of the healing was taken as a sign of God proving their innocence or guilt. Then we got the hue and cry. This idea is not at all unlike what might happen in a modern shopping centre if someone saw a shoplifter. Now, villagers in a hundred had a legal responsibility to alert the community to a crime and to hunt down the criminal. Fines were paid for failing to raise the hue and cry, so there was a real incentive to actually do this. If you consider the modern example, if you saw a shoplifter, you might say and shout shop thief, uh, stop thief and some people might actually chase them. It would depend on the situation. Well, with the high hue and cry, imagine the image that we saw at the start there. There we can see someone stealing a loaf of bread. The woman coming out of the house would be shouting, stop thief, you've got my bread, or whatever else. And then other people in the local houses would come out of their doors, also pointing and shouting and hollering, stop thief. And eventually you'd get a group of people together to hunt down the perpetrator and arrest them. That's how it worked. So let's put it together. How did Anglo-Saxon society work? People could better themselves. This was important because. Trade was important to the English economy. This was important because. Life was hard and, low, and life expectancy was low. This was important because. The king was dependent on the earls to rule England. This was important because. And earls competed against one another to be the king's favourite. This was important because. And people owed military service to their lord. This was important because. So your task is to choose any two of these sentence starters and finish the explanation based on the information that you've gathered so far. As an extension then, consider this statement. Do you agree or not? Anglo-Saxon England was effectively government. Explain how far you agree and make sure you back it up with some specific examples. You'll probably want to spend about 10 minutes on that, so pause the video now. OK, hopefully we've done that and we can move on to the last task. Here we're going to put our knowledge to the test in a basic exam question. Describe two features of the social system of Anglo-Saxon England. Now the four mark questions like this are the easiest questions that you'll probably encounter in the exam. But like anything, they're only easy if you know the information. Therefore consider this. The question says social system. Anything that's social relates to people, so society. So bear that in mind. In the exam, you'll be given a basic layout of how to do your answer. You'll be given the heading feature one and then some lines to write on, then feature two and some more lines to write on. So that's kind of how it would look in the exam. Pretty straightforward. You will not need to write very much. So sentence starters to help you if you need them, but many of you simply will not need this. You can consider this information if you need to though. It's only four marks, so don't spend long on it. Usually between four and six minutes is plenty of time in which to do this. So give a feature, explain what it means in more detail, give another feature, and then explain what it means in more detail. If you can do that, you've got four marks. So pause the video now and give yourself five or six minutes to do that question. Pause now. Okay, let's consider an example answer. Feature one. One feature of the social system in Anglo-Saxon England was the king's use of earls. One mark, because that's both accurate and relevant. The earls were important because they helped to enforce the king's laws and authority in, those, in, in their local areas or earldoms. Okay, so that's extra detail. That's my second mark. Feature two. Another feature of the social system in Anglo-Saxon Anglo England was slavery. That is a mark because it's relevant. Ordinary peasants could sell themselves into slavery in desperate times to provide for their families. And it really is as simple as that. Take a moment to check your own answer. Would you have got those four marks? If you haven't, improve your answer now. If you need to improve the accuracy or if you just want to have another go, you could also always take some inspiration from this example answer. But on that note, the lesson ends here. That's just a brief introduction to Anglo-Saxon government and we'll be looking at some of those factors in more detail in lessons to come. Other than that, thanks very much for watching and I hope that this has been useful to you. If it has, then please like this video and consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you and goodbye.